The difference between these buses is zero emissions. So it's totally friendly on the atmosphere. There's no more pollution when it comes to driving these buses. It's much smoother. The ride is way more comfortable for the passengers. And you pretty much save, you save gas. There's no more need for any gas on these. You can run pretty much over eight hours on a full charge bus with this. You're saving a lot of money that way. The bus is extremely, extremely quiet. Matter of fact, as, as I'm standing here right now, the bus is actually on, running, and you're not hearing anything. So this is how quiet this bus is right now. You know, this is pretty much what you're gonna be hearing throughout the day, just going through the neighborhood, you no longer have to hear all that noise, the diesel noise. There's no more diesel noise like the, the old buses had now. It's all quiet. Grandma and grandpa won't be upset anymore when the buses are coming to the neighborhood. <laughs> we have a front port right here for charging. There's two areas to charge this bus. We have the front. You can charge it from here. That's the front port. We also have a rear port. About $10 on a full charge. That's the, that's the next port right here. You got a master switch cut off right here. Fully charged from 0% to about 100. You're looking at about probably between five and six hours. Okay, to get a full charge on these. It charge pretty fast. On the average, we can cover a little about 150 to about 200. Yeah, give or take. You're between 150 to about 200 miles within that 10 hours. So that's more than enough to cover a whole schedule. A whole schedule. So back here, there's no more engine compartment anymore because it's all electric now. So with these buses, you've got two batteries on top and you've got two batteries at the bottom. That's pretty much what keeps these buses running. This bus can seat 29, so it's a 35 footer. It can seat 29, but you also have a lot of standing room also. A lot of standing room. Another neat feature is the turn signal. When you put the turn signal on this bus, people on the outside can hear it now. You know, so if you're in a crosswalk, that helps. Or, or if that person is blind, it helps. Hello. Hi. What about the... No problem. For just to, yeah. So, so cool. how are you? Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. So now, as you can see, from outside, if you're in a crosswalk, that sound right there, that's the turn signal. So you can hear, so when the bus is getting ready to go left or right, you can hear that. Okay? That's pretty much it. And for the wheelchair, it's much easier to secure a wheelchair on this bus. For oh, the wheelchair on this now, it's, it's wheelchair friendlier because now these straps are secured. They stay clean. So the person doesn't have to worry about getting these things. The shoulder straps. You got the front. This is for the front wheel right here to secure. This is a lock. So this goes around the So this stays clean. On the older buses, these would be on the ground. So now these are secure. They stay clean that way. Okay? Same thing on the other side over there. And that's pretty much your emergency exits. You have a sensor now, so when you're getting off the bus, it knows when someone is standing here. So the bus won't pull off until the person clears this door. So you no longer will be trapped. Kids or handbags, baskets or whatever, it has a sensor that lets people know that there's still someone here. So until you move over here, they're free to close the door. So that's a nice safety feature right there on these buses also. Okay, so with these electric buses, we're strictly doing 18s and Route 25s, which goes to Tacoma Park and Langley Park. Langley Park to Tacoma. So we're basically trying to deal with the neighborhoods that's tight. The areas where we gotta get people in and out of the neighborhood. So the 18s and the 25s are pretty congested. So these buses, or designed for that type of tight driving. Tacoma Park Cooperative Nursery School is over 75 years old. Uh, we've, uh, we're a parent cooperative, which means that parents come in, they help us run the school, 
and they help us teach the children and we provide training for the parents to be able to do that. Uh, we have a board of directors and we have just only four staff members. So our staff costs are quite low in order to be able to operate at a lower cost to the savings to the parents, but they do it does require them to do volunteer hours. Our school serves ages two through five, and we also have a summer program, which we couldn't hold this year. So a summer camp program for older children, K through fifth grade. We were not able to operate that because we couldn't fully uh, feel comfortable that we would be able to keep the children and the staff safe at the time that we had started learning about all the different vectors and how we needed to clean. So we canceled those all together. Again, this is at a huge cost uh, that we've, our, our, our income has been really severely affected. Since then, we've learned about how we can open and reopen for our younger ones. So we plan to reopen on August, in August, uh, August 31st, with a much changed program. So it, we don't have the parents in to volunteer. We've increased our staff in order to make sure that we can get the cleaning and take care of the children effectively. Everyone's required to wear masks, children and adults and we are going to an all outdoor programming. I could only have 22 kids in this, in this area and now with the Office of Child Care restricting the population to 15 people in a room, I can only keep 12 kids. So there'll be 12 kids, there'll be two teachers and there'll be me. So to open up the school for 12 kids and then what do I do with the rest of the 10? I have a cleaning company uh, which was cleaning up, cleaning the school every day and obviously uh, they came to me asking me if I was ready to open and uh, they've like the cost obviously has gone up twice because now they're going to be sanitizing more, they're going to be using all the other sophisticated uh, cleaning agencies or cleaning products to clean up the school. Along with that, I'm going to be buying more Clorox, more uh, Clorox wipes, hand sanitizers, and paper towels. So the cost is really going to go up a lot from what we used to be spending earlier. Closing was really hard for us because a lot of our families still had to work. So of course it left a large impact on them needing care and we couldn't provide that care. Now that we're back open, of course, like many of the centers. We've lost some families, you know, they're just kind of delayed in coming back because they're concerned. Everybody is concerned. We made sure that um, we did the trainings with the staff that was that were going to um, return back to the center. We sent out a PowerPoint to the parents letting them know our step-by-step -step procedures um, of what we were going to do as far as drop-off, um, during the day and pick up. A large percentage of our day is spent out here until it gets really warm and then we go inside. But we do wear our mask all day inside and then outside we're with our mask on. If we're six feet apart, we can pull it down, but once we're not six feet apart, then we have to pull our mask back up. The school closed on March 13th, 2020. And when we closed, we thought that we were only going to be closed for a week or two. And it was about the time of spring break, so we weren't really sure about how we were going to uh, reopen. We quickly learned, of course, that the schools were going to be closed through the duration of our school year, which was up through June. The financial piece is really key for us, this financial support, and I'm grateful to the state, and I'm grateful to the county, and I'm really grateful to the city because they are also backing us up. We have so many uh, resources available to us. One of the things that was really helpful is that from the state, we received cleaning supplies. So we have access to healthcare grade bleach, healthcare grade cleaning supplies, things that we would not have normally even be able, we wouldn't have even been able to buy it. I just want my school to open up as soon as possible. I worry about my kids. I think about them. And what I'm doing now is that uh, I'm going to be supporting them till the school doesn't open. I will go to their homes. People are making pods, uh, two, three families getting together. So I'm helping them set up those pods. We're assuring them that we're doing what we're supposed to do with the CDC guidelines and 
practicing the social distancing, wearing the mask, um, hand washing, um, using the disinfects that we're supposed to use as, as well as sanitizing the building. We plan to reopen on August 31st with a much changed program. In terms of cleaning, we want to come at it from a two-part two approach. So we want to have some occasional professional cleaners coming in who know what they're doing with the supplies that are, again, outside of our ability to buy and our ability to know how to use. So we want to start the year with a big clean, uh, a deep clean, and we want to schedule those periodically. The staff is trained to clean on the ground. So this is with bleach and with the disinfectant that we do all the time. We, our program has always washed hands, but we need to increase their the, their access to sinks. So this is some place where I'd really like to get help from the state because we'd like to move our hand washing stations outside. In spite of um, everything that's going on, we're still going to love their children, you know. So our concerns are just the families feeling safe when they drop off, knowing that, you know, when they pick up, their, their, their children are okay. In order to do all the things that we know we need to do, it's going to cost a lot of money. Our budget was set in December of last year, pre-COVID. So not only have, or do all the daycare facilities, all the family daycares, every school that serves early childhood is taking the same hit. We set our budget and COVID requires a different budget. It's going to increase our staff costs, it's going to increase our materials costs, and it increases, it increases our focus, our attention in how things have to be cleaned. And, and what we do when ch to make sure we take care of children effectively. As a director, my job is to make sure that um, the teachers are providing the care that they're supposed to provide to the families and that the children are safe. And the most rewarding thing is, you know, for me, we didn't think the children were gonna remember us when they came back. You know, we did our Zoom classes um, while we were home. But it just made me feel really great that the babies ran back to us and they knew who we were. And that lets me know that we're doing something right. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have the anxiety. We didn't have a lot of the crying or anything like that. The kids were really glad to come back. And these children were young, you know, when they left, they were 12, 13 months. And now they're, some of them are 15, 16 months and they're happy to see us. And for me as a director, that's all that matters, is that I see their little smiling faces and they see mine and they know that they're okay. The city's Arts and Humanities Division decided to do a new public art project that combined literacy and public art in five new little library boxes that we wanted to put in areas of the city that were outside of the historic district in the downtown where a lot of little libraries were already located uh, in areas where there was a greater need uh, for books. And so we hired two artists, uh, Samantha Contrino and Katie Makishin and they came up with a concept to feature female authors and activists of color and also a lesbian author, Virginia Woolf. The other authors included uh, black author and activist Maya Angelou, Ethiopian educator and the first uh, woman in the Ethiopian legislature, Sinadu Gebru, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner Rigoberta Minshew, and children's book author Juana martinez Neal. This is my first public arts project, so it meant a lot for sure. So I, I, I loved every moment of it. I love being, I mean, as a painter myself, I really enjoy just using my hands and like working on things. And this was a new way to use my skills and apply to something that was going to be visible to the public and community used often and also representing a cause that I feel strongly about. A lot of the times people don't see 
authors' faces. So I thought it would be great to represent them in like their portraits as uh, an idea for the boxes. I'm gonna have to give Sam credit for the concept of the libraries. Um, she came to me already with sort of a loose idea and then we sat down at a coffee shop and made a list of all of the femme authors that have influenced us. And then from there we kind of whittled it down and copied and pasted and figured out the final five. When we first received the libraries, they needed some cleaning to be done, so we had to prep the surface of the wood in addition to some dry time. And um, in order to prep it, we had to do lots of sanding and cleaning and um, multiple layers of paint, uh, painting on top of wood, especially putting portraits on top of wood that is unfinished can be difficult because you need to put those fine details in. Painting the boxes was super fun. Um, I love doing like DIY kind of projects. So the sanding was very relaxing. We listened to some podcasts and um, chilled out on the roof, but it did get to be um, quite a bit of elbow grease to get these boxes ready for the portraits, but 60% preparation, 40% art is how you have a long lasting public piece. I think it's good because um, we can, because it's the school year and we can grab different books from it and we can read different ones. Books help you learn a lot and so a lot of people use books to mostly just read but then, yes and some people can make like a whole library. Let's start. Um, I went to the exhibition you had where you displayed the various artists and the uh, libraries and it was great to see different uh, artists represented. represented. It's a learning experience for me and the mm -hmm. kids because when Em and I walked up here um, and we you know weren't familiar with the author but it gave us the opportunity to become familiar with her work and what she's done. I was really excited when I found out that we would have one of the um, new little libraries here in Ward 3 in the Pinecrest neighborhood and right next to a park because it's a really great interaction having children and families here and then to be able to go over and check out books and learn about a new author and to see um, the bilingual nature of it and connect with those things and so I'm really excited to have this here and I think it's already been utilized a lot and I know it's going to continue to be in the future as well. I think it's really cool that it's a project where we had a local artist that created these really great pieces of art, but they're also pieces of art that are useful because they're something that we can put books into and we can share as a community. And in this time, especially with COVID, it's such an important um, opportunity to build community, to build um, opportunities for literacy and exchange. The quotes on the side of the libraries are mostly from either parts of like their speeches or excerpts from some of their writings and uh, in particular for Juana Martinez which is the library we're looking at we tried to do both the English and Spanish versions of it um, to represent uh, just who she is and I mean how it's written to written in her novels she she both she sort of uses like a Spanglish in a lot of her children's books and we wanted to represent that in a way in writing. A lot of us, we live nearby, just up the street, and we can just come down here. I also really like it, I enjoy it, because um, it's right next to the park, and sometimes me and my friends will jog down here, or walk down here and just hang out, and then I can pick up a book after. When I walk down here, or I'm just walking around the block, I'll see little kids coming here. So when I have, old books that I want to give to them. I can easily just put them in there and they will hopefully enjoy them. Having the library in a place like this where lots of kids see it, they see a woman's smiling face, they see lots of colorful books and it makes it more fun to engage with. I know for our family when we walk around the neighborhood and other parts of Tacoma Park we've seen them and we always thought it would be great to have one right here at the park where a lot of people congregate. It's right near the sidewalk where 
people are walking by with their dogs and can stop and get look for a book. It's a great addition to the, to the community. It provides another perspective for all of us to appreciate the broad reach of literature and, and give students and other students and, and children everywhere kind of a sense of uh, community and expanding that community, kind of what is community. So it, it helps to build on that. Representing women of color and Virginia Woolf, who is also a lesbian author, it was extremely important because uh, they're just underrepresented in the community and undervalued most of the time. And that's who we wanted to show. We only had an option for per five libraries, so we tried to pick a diverse group of authors. I think public art is really important in the community, and especially this sort of project where it brings together so many of our goals as a city. It's an opportunity to reach out to children, to families, it addresses our racial equity concerns and helps to bring voice to some new authors that people might not have uh, so much familiarity with. It also um, is a chance for people to see public art in their everyday lives, in their neighborhoods, right outside of their front doors. And that's really special, I think. Uh, so this is the type of project I really value and the type I'd like to see more of in the future. The City of Tacoma Parks Arts and Humanities Division sponsored this public art project originally a decade ago by artist couple Jim Colwell and Allison Baker. And they painted, hand painted more than 20 signs uh, representing kind of a fun fruit crate design, uh, which had different ideas relating to Tacoma Park, which they will tell you about. And over a decade, the signs started to wear from the elements, and so. Uh, we hired Jim and Allison to print their original designs on aluminum panels and to install them over the fading paintings so that they will last for many more years to come. Uh, there's been a great response uh, to these signs that are scattered around the city on about 20 different uh, gateway kiosks and information signs. And so we wanted to keep them uh, looking fresh and available uh, for future generations. A little over 10 years ago, Jim and I won the commission to create signs around Tacoma Park. And like other commissions, there were uh, artists from around the country who put in, who submitted proposals, but our proposal incorporated, I think, the local elements and the history of Tacoma Park, so we won the commission. We created crate label signs, partially because we thought that the, just the, the size, the, the shape of the signs would be really great as far as a crate label goes. And also because Tacoma Park is, as everybody knows, 140 or so years old, we wanted to create just a sense of the history of Tacoma Park as well. And vintage crate labels was what we came up with. Because the signs were already existing, um, they they were in many different places around the town and we decided it would be uh, easy to um, try to make the signs that we um, placed in these different places and different signs have some kind of relation to the neighborhood and to the history of that neighborhood and uh, we we've been residents here since about 1980 so we actually knew a lot about the local history and lore and uh, even experienced some of the um, the different kinds of uh, you know commercial establishments and things that were in the town that we could try to incorporate into these designs and so we did a little research and found out that um, you know there's a lot of stuff we didn't know about Tacoma Park that we were able to put into the signs and we tried to honor um, other, you know, individuals that were important in the history of Tacoma Park, musicians mm -hmm. and politicians, and it was really a fun project. Yeah. Um, well, we chose that format, the, the fruit label crate format, because it's about the same format as what was required for the signs. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it worked out pretty well. Fruit label crate, crate labels 
are are very colorful and, and they had a history of being a history of being very artistic you know with uh, a lot of imaginative names for different orchards and you know growers and things so bountiful or delicious or you know Roscoe would have been very much in keeping with what would have happened at the turn of the century so Roscoe the rooster for example you'll see that sign over in the uh, historic downtown area um, and that represents the rooster that oh gosh 30 years ago roamed all around Tacoma Park he's since become the, the kind of symbol for Tacoma Park. Mascot. Yes, the mascot. And I remember when he actually was alive and right outside my door, there he was, crowing in the morning and waking us all up. So there's a Roscoe Rooster sign. There's a Barcelona Nuts sign, which is has to do with um, uh, the, the nut factory that was across the street um, that now is historic Tacoma building. Um, it also is where the um, trolley uh, used to go through Tacoma Park, so we called that trolley nuts for the crate, crate label sign, and you can see that actually at the place where that all was happening. So we just tried to really reflect the very place where these signs would be. Well, after 10 years, they needed restoration, <laughs> quite majorly. So we investigated and found a way that we could put um, the images on we could put the images on metal so that there should be more durability and the color should remain true for a much longer period of time. So Plus we're looking now forward to that. With, with this technology, which didn't really exist 10 Back years then, ago, yeah. it'll be possible to, if these signs get faded or damaged, it'll be possible to replace them Quite easily. at a reasonable price in the future. So it's a, it's a nice um, way of taking care of the art, actually. Yeah. This is Trolley, the one we were talking about, that has uh, a trolley, and it says Trolley Cashews in honor of Barcelona Nuts that was across the street from the trolley stop. So that's well, that The one. trolley stop was at Carol and uh, Ethan Allen. Right. There's a, there's a little bus stop there. That's, that's where there's a mural. It's across from uh, the uh, co-op. Right. And... Uh, yeah. yeah. Once upon a time, there was a trolley land that, that ran up here from D.C. And down at the bottom of Carroll, um, it may have gone that far, I'm not sure, but there was actually uh, a casino down there. Yeah, that's true, too. And people we would come did. out here and yeah. have a lot of fun. We didn't know. do a casino uh, yeah, that, that great label. A that would fuzzy, be fun, but, yeah, but we whatever. didn't. Old Oaks, pretty self-explanatory, as Tacoma Park is known for its, its trees. And here's Roscoe, the beloved rooster who wake, awakened everybody. He got hit by a car. Yeah, oh well. Uh, most people in Tacoma Park know that Tacoma Park is designated as a playful city, USA. So in honor of that, and also with another nod to the farmer's market, we did this crate label, Playful Tomatoes. Also, there's lots of good um, playgrounds That's in Tacoma true. Park. Yep. It's lots a great of kids. Kids friendly area. And another one, Mango Mundo, which is uh, uh, was created for the crossroads um, to reflect the many and diverse um, nationalities that are represented there and around Tacoma Park. Yeah, a lot of a lot of Spanish speakers over there. So. So that's our Mango Mundo. Yeah. Who, who doesn't love mangoes? That's true. And there are a few examples.